Hello, hello, it's Sleepy Reader, aka Damien. Com my comic book countdown, my, my thoughts on the comic books I bought on Wednesday, April 10th. It's now the next Wednesday. <laughs> I have procrastinated for no particular good reason. Uh, I just let things get in my way. This this video should have come out a few days ago by my by my own calculations. But anyway, I have eight comic books I bought on Wednesday, April 10th, and they every one of them has some interesting stuff, but I don't think I loved a very many of these. Um, I appreciated the top two quite a lot, um, and I had fun with some of the others. But let's start with number eight, which was Morningstar. I guess this did not, was technically not released April 10th, but sometime in March. But I saw it listed as a, shown as a new comic at a comic store I go to last Wednesday. And I was immediately, um, when I just sort of flipped through it, I was kind of attracted to the, to some of the artwork and the colors. And then I noticed that the color was by Jason Wordy, who's a colorist whose work I've really liked. And later I noticed that the art was, I mean, the script was by uh, David Andry, or he was one of the scripters, and he did a really good book from Vault that is kind of a weird post-apocalyptic book that I'm now not remembering well. I mean, I am remembering it well, except I can't remember the title. Damn it. Um, so this, it's not, the, and that was from Vault, and now Vault doesn't publish many comics it seems so maybe they've turned to um what's it called black mad cave i don't think i've gotten many mad cave books in the past i don't think they they get distributed in my many of my shops um anyway it was hard to tell what this was about or what was really going on in this book but essentially uh, a family loses the their husband father in a fire uh, like a forest fire. And I don't know if he's a firefighter, but I guess he is. Um, and so the first scene in the book is him in the fire or trying to escape the fire. And something weird is going on. Like they see these bodies. I'm spoiling it because I didn't understand it. Maybe someone else did. But I think the real point is none of this is going to become clear till future issues. They see these weird sort of Bodies, maybe they're turned to glass, maybe they're all melded together. I'm not sure what we're supposed to be seeing. And then something happens to his partner. Does his partner get turned into something too by the fire? Um, and and then we're left to think that he died. And then we go to the family and their sort of struggles in recovering from the fire, uh, relatives who want them to move away from Montana. Um, the arts, the arts kind of pleasing. It's not quite, it, it feels like it needs a little more at times. I mean, the biggest example is this double page spread where, you know, it's such a simple drawing. It doesn't seem like it needed a double page spread. Um, and the, 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 uh, colors are purposefully restrained in a certain way. And there's a lot of screen tones put over things it's it's interesting but i'm not sure what the i don't sort of immediately um grok <laughs> immediately understand you know sort of what the style of this comic uh means in a way i don't know it feels like it should mean something i don't know why but uh but it is there's something pleasing about it too but the then the family is going to a uh a real national forest where they're going to stay in one of these old watch uh fire watch towers and i know you can rent fire watch tower old fire watch towers because they watch for fires in different ways now i guess uh, you can rent them for vacations so i guess they're renting it to spread his ashes um and then at the end of the story it appears i mean it's just kind of to one of his children he appears but in two different forms so I've just spoiled the ending here i really apologize but none of it makes sense so there's i'm not spoiling anything i feel like because we don't know what we're seeing 
and it might be really cool in issue two. I don't know if I'll pick up issue two or not. What did, was this? Yeah, this was a four of oh, five dollar book, a four ninety nine book. You can see I I accidentally dropped it. Um, actually, the cat, cat knocked it over. Uh, so yeah, I was slightly intrigued, but just I can't say that I really had a great time reading it because I just spent my time wondering what was going on and and felt sort of puzzled and dissatisfied at the end. But it could turn out to be a really good story in trade, I think. Um, then I picked up Transformers number seven. This was probably a mistake. I, according to my shop, the Transformers trade, which I want to read is come, you know, with the Daniel Warren Johnson art and everything is coming out, uh, at the end of the month. And so that's unusual for image comics. Usually a trade comes out and then the next, uh, the next story beat starts. So I thought, well, I'll just give it a try. I can read it after I um, get the trade, but just make sure I get the issue. So I grabbed the issue. And and then I thought, well, what the heck? I'll just try reading it and see the old dive in the middle technique and see how it works. And um, I enjoyed the art and the kind of the very bold color. The the color almost almost doesn't work at times. It's too like all the oranges and then the colors of the robots on this page, they kind of clash, but they kind of are exciting at the same time. Um, I would not have known this is Jorge Corona art from the other Jorge Corona books I've read. I really like his art a lot, um, but this looks nice too, but I have a feeling he's um, he's channeling Daniel Warren Johnson to a, uh, to a degree. I love the lettering in this comic. Who's the letterer? Um, they don't list him on the cover, but it's uh, Russ Wooten. Really excellent lettering in here. Um, and the most of the coloring is really nice in the art. Um, but I could barely distinguish characters and uh, none of all their little sort of, you know, some robots fight each other for dominance. Some other robots ponder whether war and killing is a good thing. Um, but I don't know which robots are which. And a robot shows up at the end. And let's see. You know, someone says, I have a plan for that. Uh, watch out, Decepticons. <laughs> so I, I don't think that's spoiling anything. But I don't know what robot that is. or I, And even if I did, I wouldn't understand the significance of it. So... I'm a little wary now about whether I really, you know, everyone is loving uh, Transformers, but I'm a little wary that I won't. And uh, even when I read the tray, but we'll see. So that was in at number seven on my list down at number six, probably the least well done, well written comic on the list, but I still had some fun reading Rat City. This is this issue is uh, ten pages longer than a regular issue, so they charged an extra dollar. A three ninety nine book, so it is going to be a two ninety nine book. I don't know if I'll pick up more. Um, there was something really irritating about the way it was written, and the art was decent, but it, it wasn't like the kind of art that that uh, you know it's really good art, but it's not the really good art for me. It's just not art that excites me, but. I'm mildly curious about where the story's going. It has a bit of, uh, you know, um, kind of reminds me of the old Deathlock comics. Um, a grim future where government and corporations, I believe, use soldiers uh, to do probably what are just nefarious deeds. I mean, at the beginning of this comic, they just kill a bunch of un unarmed people and then blow up the and supposedly they're working for the government and blow up their um their stockade or whatever the place where they live the sort of armored armored residence that they live in and then and then the after that they get attacked by who we don't know the mission goes south and uh and a few survivors 
get rebuilt as robot soldiers. But then apparently they're not good enough cyborg soldiers, sorry, not robot soldiers. And they get just sent away after probably, you know, huge amounts of money when spent on their, on repairing their bodies. <laughs> um, so the guy's living in the ghettos of Rat City and then something happens. I don't know what, uh, some kind of explosion that relates somehow to Spawn and multiverses that Spawn is affecting, I think. That's my guess. And um, and something happens to him. Or does it? I don't know. Um, he seems to get stronger and stuff, or just angrier. I don't know. Uh, so whatever's going to... And then basically uh, Spawn appears to him at the end of this issue. So it's all leading up to whatever's really going to happen. It's just sort of a garbled, not well thought out back backdrop to the character <laughs> leading up to him getting spawn character, uh, spawn powers, I guess, but he's a cyborg also. I don't know what's going to happen. I don't really understand enough of spawn, I suppose, either. Great, great uh, cardstock cover, great paper. And like I said, the, the art is good. It's just sort of not the kind that tickles my, my fancy um but that so that was at number six that said at number five i put napalm lullaby i could have put napalm lullaby lower there were, it was it was a um unsatisfying issue i i kind of have some leftover energy from the first issue of napalm lullaby which was frustrating in its own way because you couldn't tell who the main characters were um, now we do know who the main characters are, I guess, which are this brother and sister who want to assassinate this sort of false god who's taken over Earth. Who, and maybe that false god is like a version of Superman who came to Earth. I'm not sure. Um, or that person put it forth the religion. Um, Bengal's artwork is i don't know it's it's fine it's fine i i liked it better than the artwork in the spawn but uh i don't know it there's not a lot there's not a lot again even though now we know who our main characters are and we kind of know what their goal is there's still not a lot about this world that we understand and um so we kind of have to make assumptions that they are um like my assumptions that it's that that baby that fell from space in the first sequence in the first issue um and and I don't know so I don't really know what they're up against but we'll probably find out in future issues I'm I'm on board just to see what Rick Remender's up to here but um it seems judge the first two issues aren't enough yet <laughs> to really know if it's going to be a good story or not um, and I'm wondering how long it's going to be. Is it a very simple story where they're just, it's just about this assassination attempt on God or on Superman, an evil, an evil sort of, uh, what's the right word? You know, one of these dystopian religions or the run by someone who's like Superman, or is it, is there something richer going on in the story? If it's a simple story, that's fine. Um, but one hopes along the way that the world building will become more satisfying. Speaking of Superman, uh, I am trying to get back into Superman, which seems kind of promising right now at DC. Um, I think that uh, Joshua Williamson is now taking over both Superman books. I don't know if it's just for this event or whether he's becoming the main Superman writer overall. Um, I put this in at number four out of eight. Uh, it looks like it's leading up to a connecting cover with the next issue. So Action and Superman are in a crossover event. Um, Superman's coming out today, so I will probably pick it up. I, I loved the art in here. Um, that's not the greatest example. It's by... Um, it's very slick, you know, kind of the kind of exactly the kind of art you expect and pretty much want from a current mainstream 
superhero comic. Great double page spreads. Uh, this was a $5 comic and it does have more pages. Um, you know, nice coloring, more double page spreads. That's pretty incredible. It, it kind of has that, a little bit of that scope that we originally got, you know, in those old authority comics in the, what is it, late 90s, early 2000s. So it's, this is the beginning of the House of Brainiac. Um, it's crammed full of characters and um, there's a certain feeling in the script writing that this is an event and I am putting all these things together. So it feels, it, the flow of it feels a little forced, but it's still fun to read. Um, the characters, I don't know, they don't feel, <laughs> it, it says this is just a subtle thing. They don't feel exactly... I, I don't 100% buy into them. I don't buy into, well, we don't even get that much of Superman's personality in here, but I don't buy into this version of Lois enough. I don't buy into this version of Lex Luthor. The Cisnerians, the, the, the race that Lobo comes from that are suddenly alive again, and they all, they just, I don't know. The, they don't come alive for me quite. So anyway, I enjoyed it, but there was a part of my brain that was constantly like, I'm not completely on board with this. Um, I'm on board enough that I'm going to pick up the Superman this week, but I'm not putting these things on my poll yet. And I um, I don't know if I'll follow the whole event. Uh, this this next issue of Superman will probably make make or break. If If at that point I don't, I will probably try some more Superman after the event is over. I think there's a, along with the be, being in the two Superman comics, it's also going to be in a Superman House of Brainiac special, part 2.5. Oh, geez. There's also tie-ins. So hopefully I can completely ignore the tie-ins. Um, I really loved the art, though. It was just fun to see a Superman comic book with some really good art. Uh, so that, yeah, there's tie-ins in Green Lantern and Power Girl. I didn't even know there was a Power Girl comic right now. Um, so part one is Action Comics. Part two is Superman. Part 2.5 is the House of Brainiac special. So it's quite possible you'd spend a lot of money on it and it would just be stalling for time. That's what happens. I read another, digitally, I read another event that Williamson did a while back. I read it with my daughter out loud because she was interested. Um, there was something ridiculous about what it was titled and it ended up, we just laughed at it as we read and, and almost all of it was space filler. Um, I think Williamson is a good writer, but that doesn't mean when he writes an event, it's a good thing. Okay, then I really got a chuckle out of Dead Weights from Ahoy. So I'm putting that at number three. And um, this is about two minor superheroes. You know, like when you have gangs of superheroes. Uh, <laughs> I, I kind of thought of the wrecking crew back that used to fight the Defenders and others. Um, not all members of the wrecking crew are, are that important. Um, so two that are kind of uh, dead weights in their group kind of get, get the heave-ho from their supervillain group. And one of them decides, you know, I'm just tired of this supervillain life and I, I want to I wanna go just get a job and be a normal person. So they're sort of on their way to do that. And this artwork's kind of nice with, I mean, it's not, uh, it's a little kind of on the loose, loose side, but the color's nice. And, um, you know, the, the expressions of the characters are nice. Uh, I don't know, this kind of stuff is less less exciting but um it's good for the sort of smaller moments uh but but by the end of this issue they're already sucked back into the life um and blamed for stuff by supervillains by, by superheroes uh so we'll see where this goes i'll definitely be picking up future issues um to see what happens uh it it's you know, like it's not as good as as Astro City or um, or uh, 
a local hero, but it's still, it's, I enjoy this genre of kind of side sideways looks at superhero comics and it's, it's pretty fun. And then the top two, I was 100% sure after I read it. Well, I was 90% sure after I read what became my number one book that it would be number one. And it stayed that way. I think last time that, uh, whoops, got some. Last time that Batman First Night came out, I gave it my number one spot. I give this my number two spot. I had a lot of fun reading it. The art is very fun. It's not, it's a, it's a really cool comic book but it's not a masterpiece it's kind of it's kind of feels kind of sloppy in some ways in the, more in the writing than the art although the art also seems you know for mike perkins is it mike yeah mike perkins to be a little looser than what he normally does the coloring is beautiful uh mike mike spicer is that the same colorist who is on the on the rat city City. No, no. Rat City had different colors. I feel like I read something else with Mike Spicer as the colors. But the, the I don't know. There's certain story like if you <laughs> you know, every Batman story, especially one that deals with his early days, has to, you know, rub up, bounce up against Batman Year One, which is just wonderfully paced and tightly put together. And this is kind of loose and baggy compared to that, but still a lot of fun. Um, and it plays with, it, and it has kind of a horror element and the, it keeps the theme of anti-Semitism in the background or, or the, or the growing fears of, um, of what may be, ha people aren't sure exactly what's happening in Germany, but what may be happening in Germany um is in the background there because this takes place in 1939 and uh so yeah it's balance balance balancing a lot of interesting themes um and it and it does and maybe the bagginess of the writing fits in with that it does also have that feeling of some kind of out there pulp crime novel or pulp crime magazine you know from the 30s you know the shadow or the spider um, up against this sort of gruesome and just somewhat impossible uh, villain situation, but not super villains. Uh, it's still the mob, but they're raising dead people to be their enforcers. <laughs> so yeah, right out of the pulp world. So yeah, I, I really enjoy it. Um, and am I being sucked back into Batman? How many Batman comics can I read uh, before I get Batman fatigue again? Um, is a, a few years ago, maybe a year and a half ago, I just decided I was going to take a complete break from Batman. And so that was a pretty long break. And I, I, I guess this is maybe the second Batman book I've read. But I really, the, the comic I really loved... It's hard to say with by the time it comes to trade, will I still really love it? We'll have to see where it goes. But this was a wonderful first issue of Uncanny Valley, um, written by Tony Fleeks, Fleece, and art by Dave Watcher. Watched her. I feel like I've seen Dave Watched her somewhere else, but his art really grabbed me here. I believe he colored it himself. And you just you get sort of a nice cross between drawing and painting here. Uh, presumably it was done digitally, but um, if it was, it, it did a great job of feeling very natural. And um, not a, you know, we're just beginning to get our plot points started in this issue. And maybe that's why I'm, I don't want to say, you know, you should for sure get this, you know, when it comes out in trade or something. Um, but we get, we have this boy who somehow doesn't get hurt when these three boys jump off a, 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 a low bridge into a dry, uh, a bed creek, uh, a dry creek bed. And um, he gets in trouble and we learn that other weird things have been happening to him at school. 
he's new to school and uh so it's kind of a three strikes you're out and he's he's out of school for for a week at home with his mom um and then so it has a really nice pace to it really nice art and we we kind of from that early scene thought there's something odd about this boy um and then look something pops out of his tv and crows are gathering around at his house and then things get crazy and then his grandfather shows up now it's sort of given away on the cover a bit there's going to be a mix of reality and cartoon reality um so yeah i'm really excited to see what happens next i do have to say of all the comics i bought i didn't buy any marvel comics this boom comic has the flimsiest paper on the cover i it's i guess it's a subtle thing but it feels like the paper on the cover is flimsier than the interior paper um and i don't understand why they would do that and it is a is a more uh so now the comics that I'm picking up, a few of them are still $3.99, and a lot of them are $4.99, $5 for a comic, which is serious money for most people. So, yeah, it was it was a fun enough week. Will I get Rat City again? I don't know. Maybe one more issue. Um, it won't, you know, it'll be $2.99. So, um, will, I, will I get Morningstar again? I, I just don't know. Um, and with Superman, Napalm L Lullaby, uh, I can't be too long. I think I'll just write it out. So I got some other comics, which I haven't read yet. I picked up Sam and Twitch, number one. Basically, because, <laughs> because comics with Bueller, Travis, when we last saw each other, was nagging me about, why didn't you pick it up? Give it a try. It's only $2.99. And the art inside looks pretty cool. So I'll give it a try. I only vaguely remember the characters Sam and Twitch from the early Spawn issues that I read, and I can't remember much about them. I mean, I know they had their own comic at some point, but I don't remember to that. And then I'm not sure when this came out or what the story is behind it, but it said Sandman Remastered. I'm particularly a big fan of this. Uh, it was an oversized Sandman special issue. This doesn't feel that thick. But it, it featured um, Sandman's interaction with Shakespeare and the play Midsummer Night's Dream, which is one of my favorite plays. And it had art by Charles Vess. Um, and Charles Vess was kind of the perfect artist for this kind of story. Um, so by remastered, I, I don't know if there'll be an explanation of the remastering here. I don't see any text. Well, here's a little text piece. Um, so maybe it will explain what the remastering is. Uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm curious what that is. So I decided to buy it. It's, it was only five bucks and this is a, is an extra long issue and it had nice cardboard, uh, cover and stuff. So I don't know when this came out even, I just saw it and picked it up June, 2024. What? <laughs> that hasn't happened yet. So anyway, it must have come out fairly recently. And then I also, I just loved this cover. Kid Flash, Aqualad, and Robin. None of those are characters I like. Brave and the Bold. Is it, is it written by Bob Haney? I guess it doesn't even credit who wrote it. But uh, I couldn't resist this. Uh, and the, these DC... The DC paper on the is kind of pseudo newsprint. It's still pretty white looking, but maybe the newsprint. I I wish I could remember what newsprint looked like the day I picked it up at the newsstand back as a kid. We have we look at the older comics, which you know maybe faded a little bit. One thing that I think uh, ink does inside of newsprint, and this paper may be too dense for that, is over time, the ink spreads out and gets a little blurred. Um, anyway, got that. And I picked up 
the latest sort of oversized issue of Black Phoenix, which is kind of a, it's also on a newsprint kind of paper. And it's, um, it's just the quirky work of, um, he doesn't have his name on the cover. Rich, rich, oh, tiny print, Rich Tommaso, he's too humble. I, I'm a Rich Tommaso fan. Um, when I've read these before, it's nothing like hits a home run, but the, I mean, cause they're all little snippets of stories, but w at least in the past issues, when it, when you add up the experience of just reading all these snippets, it's just really charming to me and I really enjoy it. Um, and the first issue was kind of crime noir. The second issue was, or these are more collections than issues, but the second collection, it's sort of somewhere between a, a trade and a floppy. Um, the second collection was kind of leaning towards the romance. And the third, this one, looks to be kind of like a Halloween issue. Um, but maybe it's, you know, playing with horror tropes of a sort. But with a light cartoony style that, you know, is a little bit, I don't know exactly, you can't quite pin it down. It's not like not like uh, um, Love and Rockets or Archie. But anyway, it feels familiar without being easy to pin down exactly what its, what its uh, antecedents are. And finally, I also was very happy to get the second trade of Local Man. So hopefully I will manage to read this before the next issue of Local Man comes out this covers issues six through nine and something called gold of local man it feels three pretty thick so it's more than I, I guess it's a total of five issues the first one was uh quite a hefty read too so um hopefully i'll read this before issue seven or sorry issue 10 of uh local man comes out or maybe someone will tell me it already came out i might I might be doing a live show with uh, a comic book worm and Metarog on Sunday. And I'm not sure which of those guys channels it'll be on or what, maybe it'll be on my channel. We all bought some art on eBay by the same artist, but each one bought a different lot and we're going to reveal and chat about that artist and the art that we bought and the experience of buying original art on eBay together, uh, possibly on Sunday. We're still in discussions. And then sometime soon, I hope to do another live show with Gore Vidal. Um, he just sent me some possible times when he might be free, and I have to check and see if I'll be free at any of those times. But uh, so that's coming up. Uh, my daughter and I might uh, just do a little video where we look through some previews like Marvel and DC previews, because she <laughs> she reads comics less, except lately um, she's re very heavy into reading these very long novels. But she gets a, a treat out of she and I looking through uh, previews, Marvel and DC previews, and making fun of them. So uh, we'll see if we do that um, and post it up. But thanks for joining me and hanging out with me, and we'll talk again soon about comics.